Welcome to Worship at Emmaus. I'm bringing you greetings this morning from a cemetery. It is Memorial Day weekend, the time when we remember those who have given the supreme sacrifice so that we in our country can enjoy the freedoms that we have. It is also a time for us to come and worship and to remember that which Jesus has given, allowing his life to be the sacrifice so that we can have eternal life. Let me share with you the scriptures from 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. The last enemy to be defeated is death. Let's join together and confess this faith that we hold on and profess to. And then let's join together in the song, All Creatures of Our God and King. The Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Restraints or constraints, limitations. Do you like being restricted, being held back? Are you the type who enjoys having someone give you a physical mandate that must be followed? We don't tend to love that sort of thing because we like doing what we want, right? Maybe you're feeling restricted today. Maybe you you feel like the limitations that you have or or that you're experiencing right now are keeping you from really experiencing life and all it has to offer. Do you ever think about this sort of thing? I want you to go with me to John chapter 9 as we get into our sermon series again in the Gospel of John, that you may have life. John chapter 9, if you grab a Bible or look on an app along with us, this is a big section of Scripture, uh, this chapter, and we're going to go through it section by section. So if you follow along, that will certainly be helpful uh, today. As you're doing that, I'm just going to pray and ask God that wherever we are at, right here and now, that He would use this time uh, to teach us, to, to encourage us, encourage us to, to, to even, uh, even cause us to be convicted in areas of our life where we need conviction. So would you bow with me as I begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful uh, that we can get into your word and through its study we are uplifted. Uh, but Lord, may it reach our hearts Uh, May it cause us to respond and apply it to our lives. And in this story of a miraculous healing of a blind man, uh, we ask you, Lord, that you would open our eyes to what we need to see through it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You ready to go? John chapter 9, starting in verse 1, it says, As he passed by, he being Jesus... He saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered then, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world... I am the light of the world. It says they're walking alongside the road in this area of Jerusalem. They, they take notice of this beggar on the side of the road. It's likely the man was known for this area. Every day he would sit in the same spot and beg. And this time they say, you know, Jesus, rabbi, teacher, right? So why is he like this? Or how did this happen? Or why did this happen? Understand this would have been a very common cultural opinion in their day. Who sinned? Or whose fault is this? Now, we might not have asked the exact same question as the disciples did on this day, but we do seek to know the origin of all problems, hardships, and in our case, crisis, right? We're just like this. We're doing it with COVID-19. Where is it from? How do we know? What really happened in that lab in Wuhan, China? But that's not the point. And it's not the point of this story. Either is it the reason for the healing that we're about to get to. Notice Jesus 
answer. And I'm paraphrasing here. It was not that there was a past sin in particular. It's not the blind man's fault or his parents' fault. It's not because of their behavior, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Whoa. (laughs) That the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, I recognize this might not, as we consider the implications that have been upon this man for many, many years of his life. We learn later that he had been dealing with this for as much as 40 years. This might not sit very well with everyone. You might be thinking, that's not fair, not not for this man, right? Or, Or you might be thinking, how can God be good and allow suffering like this? Well, we don't have all the answers. Jesus only gives us these answers, the ones we're looking at today. And it causes me to reflect in my own life and admit we don't see all that God sees. And if we can admit that, church, then, then there's a humbling that needs to occur in our hearts. But again, Jesus makes clear with these answers that he does give us, we were created to display the works of God. And even in a broken and fallen world where there is all forms of evil and corruption and suffering, Jesus tells us God will use it for his glory Uh, No, the enemy wants to destroy and and kill and confuse and is doing a very good job at that. Uh, That's why we face suffering. Uh, We turn from God in rebellion and in our brokenness. And yet God is going to use it for a greater purpose. And although that's hard to take here and now, I think for many of us, we know in our hearts that God is wonderfully Good. By faith we believe and trust in that. And we believe His love and grace is enough because He has eternity in mind. This is important for us to contemplate right now in what we're facing today. God will use it for His purpose. He's doing it right now. Maybe even in this crisis, church, He's going to birth something that we could have never imagined before the time we are facing today. Notice again what Jesus says next. I read it earlier. We must work the works of Him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming. While I am here, I am The light, meaning you have been given a particular time. And you have been placed in a particular place. And that matters to God. It's been ordained by God. And there's only so much time before not only our end, but the day in which the kingdom will come, when Christ will return. Meaning there's no in-between time, no waiting time, no restricted time time. So I'm wondering how that sits with us today. I'm I'm dealing with that myself. How does that sit with you in the middle of the crisis, in the frustration or the fear or the sadness or the confusion or the unknown? Let's get back to the text and and read on what happens here as we go to verse 6 and the miraculous healing. Having said these things, it says he spit on the ground and made mud with saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and he washed and he came back seeing. (laughs) What a miraculous thing, right? What an awesome thing. Imagine being there, this miraculous healing right before their eyes in a man who had been Blind since birth. For 40 years he could see nothing and now he is seeing. Imagine what's going through his mind. As you can imagine, this miraculous healing created quite a stir. It it caught the attention of the people in the community, which then caught the attention of the religious leaders. But remember, it's these religious leaders that oppose Jesus. And they came into the picture here to question the validity of the story. 
And, and, and although we're not going to take all the time to read through every single verse, uh, we will summarize a bit of what comes next. Because what happens next is the religious leaders find out that this healing took place on the Sabbath. And, and part of the rabbinic law was that you didn't do things like that or healing, medical things like that on the Sabbath. And so they bring it into question. So first they bring the man into their presence and say, what, what happened? How did this happen? Who did this? And of course, he pointed to a man at that point he could not see. But they don't believe it. Why? Because they're, they're filled with unbelief. They're, they're their hearts are hardened towards what was happening before their very eyes. And so they bring the man on the scene, and rather than rejoice with him for what he has now experienced and is, in, is, and is experiencing, or rather they question him uh, to the point that they don't believe him. And so next they bring his parents. <laughs> Because not only do they not believe it happened, they kind of think he's in on the whole plot, the whole scheme. So they bring in the parents, and their first question to the parents was, was he really blind from birth? And they say, yeah, yeah, he was. Uh, who healed him? And they say, you can ask him, he's an adult. They're, they're kind of getting away from the question because they realize that there are spiritual implications in their own life if they answer this question wrong, kind of like a political correctness. They cannot say this, but they should say this. That, that's the pressure that the religious leaders put on them in this case. And so they go back to the man who has been healed. And they say, confess before us. Be honest with us. Who healed you? And that's where we pick up our story in verse 24. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. What that kind of meant was be honest. We know that this man is a sinner. They're, they're talking about Jesus. We know that this man is a sinner, he answered. Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Confess. Confess, right? And he answered them, I've told you already. And you would not listen. Listen to the simplicity. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> and they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we're disciples of Moses. The arrogance comes out in, in this. Verse 29, we know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, they're talking about Jesus here, this guy, we do not know where he comes from. But it's really an unwillingness, isn't it? They've already made up their mind. They were divided over Jesus and whether or not the healing was legitimate. And rather than rejoice in the healing, they dig in further into their stubbornness. It can be like that when unbelief gets into the heart of one who claims belief in God. It, it starts with a lack of faith and trust. And, and then it turns into a stubbornness of religious zeal or even you know, of opinion. Instead of a heart of grace towards those in need, in this case... Instead of a heart of grace towards our neighbor, we wish that everyone else would be exactly like us. Believe exactly what we believe. And if they don't, well, then we condemn them or judge them or fight back. And, and pushing and pushing and pushing at our own rules, not, not the law of God. Our own regulations, rather than the gospel and the grace of Jesus Christ. That Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And that He wishes to display, despite our limitations, His work through us. And so what happens? The man is banned from the temple. He, he's banned from even coming back and receiving what he needs, and that is the truth. Look with me at verse 35. 
Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, And who is he, sir, that I might believe in him? Why? Because he was blind when Jesus healed him and then told him to go and wash, right? He had laid the mud upon his eyes and then he had told him and he must have been led to the place, by the way, where you can go in Jerusalem today and be healed. But he didn't know who it was. Jesus heard that they had cast him out and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? See his faith. And Jesus said to him, You have seen him and it is he who is speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I... I believe, and here's the correct response, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into the world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. Now, you, you remember just earlier on in John chapter 3, verse 17, Jesus says, For I did not come into the world to condemn the world, for he did not come into the world to condemn the world. But think about this. Condemnation comes upon the person, the soul, that refuses to believe in the truth. We heap that condemnation upon ourselves. Again, Jesus says in verse 39, For judgment that came into the world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Whoa. Whoa. The, the physical restrictions, right? The physical blindness of the man kept him from seeing until one day Jesus walked into his life and healed him. And yet from the start, God had a plan to display his glory through his limitations. And on the other hand, the spiritual blindness of the Pharisees kept them from seeing Messiah kept them from seeing the very person that they were put on this earth to prepare the people to see. See, here's the thing, and and here's the point. God wants to use our limitations. Believe me, He wants to use our limitations, our, our personal limitations, our circumstantial limitations to reflect His power. I might not have all the answers as to why these things are happening in my life, but faith informs me that I have a Savior that will go with me in my limitations and use them for greater purposes. I don't know if you know this name, but Johnny Erickson Tata, a woman who was paralyzed from the neck down from a swimming accident as a little child, she wrote this, And and it's just something that I so take to heart. She said this, Only God is capable of telling us what our rights and needs are. Because he knows everything, right? And then she says this, You have to surrender that right to him. For he is God and we are not, right? And then she goes on to say this, Deny your weakness and you will never realize God's strength in you. You'll be lacking. You'll be missing something. And then she says this. Sometimes God allows what He hates to accomplish what He loves. Understand. We see ourselves as those who see. Let me say it again. We see ourselves as those who see. Like we know. We get it. We understand. But let us not be so arrogant to believe we know everything. For unbelief 
can be found even in those who claim Jesus. Self-righteousness, for example. That feeling or display of moral superiority found in personal opinions, beliefs, even our own affiliations. This blinds us to our limitations. Just as one example, like age and knowledge. How about our own influence in relationship? Our sin. It it keeps us from experiencing the contentment we are so desperately in need of every day we face any crisis we will face. See, we need a Savior. That's the bottom line. We need someone to rescue us. For the religious leaders in our story... Their knowledge and opinion and understanding and pride, it blinded them from their sin and lack of understanding, even though they thought they knew everything. May this not be with us. May this not be with us. You know, I'd love if you just took a moment where you're at right now, And and grabbed a pen or a paper or a device so that you you can just write down or type down or journal a bit about this. Here's what we're going to do. Let's write down what limitations we have personally that God might use to display his work in our life. I want you to actually write it down. Now, if you can't do this right now, take some time and do it later. But but it's important that we, we... We take the time to do this because to really ponder this subject and to really apply it, it's going to be important that we do this. I want us to journal a bit about what limitations we have personally that God might use to display His work in our lives. If it's confession, I want you to pen that on paper, so to speak. If it's coming to the reality that what you don't want in your life or in your circumstances, maybe God does in order for you to see your need for Him, I want you to write that down. Would you take the time? Even if you have to pause this, take the time. And then when all is said and done, would you pray with me as I close? Again, don't let this opportunity pass you by. Write it down journal it, and then spend some time with God. If you would allow me, I want to do that right now. Father, you might be in this very moment, wherever we are, showing us our own limitations, maybe even some limitations we don't want to admit and we don't want anyone else knowing. Because what you want to do is you want to take those limitations and you want to show the world your glory. You have a purpose for the things that we are experiencing today. And yet you cannot birth, so to speak, what it is that you desire unless we respond. Because you choose to work through us. And we know you will have your way. You don't, you don't need us in that sense, but boy, you want us to fulfill your will. And you desire that more and more people would come into your kingdom and experiencing, experience your grace, your mercy, your love, and your joy. And so I just pray, Lord, as we deal with our own limitations, we would release what it is that we don't understand to you. And in respecting that, we would allow you to use us for everything that you desire in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name.
It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Paul, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that is in Christ. 
God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and trusting to us the message of reconciliation. We have that hope, as we heard Pastor Nick talk about, where God's power is displayed through our lives, in our weakness, as he gives the blind sight. Paul continues in saying, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He has allowed us and called us to live every day to be a light through Christ in us. But say, Lord, it's you gave me life and I can't explain just how much you mean to me now. You have saved me, Lord. I give all that I am to you every day. I can be a light that shines your name. It's you I live for. I do pray that it is Jesus that you live for every day. And this Memorial Day weekend gives us a moment, a time to pause and reflect. What is it that we live for? What is your purpose in life? I'd like to encourage you with 
the verses at the end of chapter uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says, in, starting in verse 54, When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And listen to this closing verse. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. We are working together for God's kingdom and go out and serve Jesus. I, if you are enjoying these worship service times online, click like underneath that YouTube video. And also, we encourage you to find subscribers. We only need 17 more subscribers to get our own YouTube link. So those are just some side things. Come and join us for our Sunday night devotional starting at 6 o'clock, May 24th. I live forever